please join us in the opening hymn. <laughs> During our greet time this morning, we invite you to reach out to three people by texting to them to see how they're doing today. And if you don't wish to do it now, dot down their names and contact them following the service. Let's be intentional about keeping in contact with one another, especially those we love, and support them through our prayers and our conversation. We welcome you to our worship here at St. Andrew's United Methodist. Thanks for tuning in and sharing with us this morning. As we start to live this new normal, we're grateful that we can continue to come together to worship and be reminded of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. Please take just a moment to fill out a Connect card online, either now or following the service, and also send us any prayer requests that you may have that we may join you in praying for them. We have a quarterly update video that we're pleased to share with you this morning, being presented by one of our lay leaders, Rachel Crafton. Hi church, my name is Rachel Crafton and I am one of the lay leaders here at St. Andrews. Today, I wanted to take this opportunity to give you a brief update on the life of our church, as well as to show you, even in these uncertain times, how we are continuing to lead people to know God and to experience His grace through a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Our pastors, our worship leaders, and our AV team remain committed to leading us in worship every week and strive to find new ways to connect with you in your home. Each week we have maintained our regular worship attendance with viewers staying engaged more and more through chat room participation um, as well as staying um, tuned in for longer periods of time each week. It's hard to know what these unique views translate to without intimately seeing you and your family is cuddled up on the couch, but I will say it appears that we are reaching more people than ever right now. We are continually moved by a creative God, and it has been an inspiration to me personally to see St. Andrews tap into this creativity. Kids, youth, and adult ministries haven't missed a beat. Although we long to meet again face-to-face, -face, many of these programs have seamlessly made the transition online. There are several online studies on Facebook, as well as other Sunday school classes meeting through Zoom. 
on Sundays, Kids Ministry has been pumping out wonderful programming for families to view at home. And Wednesday Night Spark just wrapped a memorable study on the real meaning of Easter eggs. Youth Ministry has been meeting every week via Zoom to check in, connect, and pray with each other. And beginning this evening, they are launching a virtual Sunday night programming with relevant messages and then break out into their normal small group discussions. And though our preschool building is closed, teaching and nurturing the children has continued, but in new ways. Teachers remain engaged with students and families with daily activities and weekly Zoom calls. I have personally witnessed these Zoom meetings with preschool classes and they are adorable and joy filled. Congregational Care and our incredible staff are currently reviewing the immediate needs of our community as well as the immediate needs of our congregation and will be launching several outreach initiatives in the coming weeks. So be on the lookout for new ways to serve. Though we have every reason to be hopeful, the Finance Committee is considering how the pandemic might impact the church. Therefore, they are actively exploring how St. Andrews can benefit from the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Securities, or CARES Act, that was recently passed by Congress. We will continue to update you as we have more information. In the meantime, our awesome and dedicated staff continues to work from home and maintain our daily operations. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank everyone that has continued to give to St. Andrews during this time of uncertainty. It is because of your giving that we are able to continue to do our mission. And finally, I want to remind all of you that next Sunday, April 26th, is Announcement Sunday, where we will hear from our Staff Parish Relations Committee Chair, Brent Jurem. I know he is really excited to share the news of our newly appointed senior pastor to St. Andrews. You'll be happy to know that Trustees Committee has been working diligently to prepare the parsonage for the arrival of our new pastor in July. I sincerely pray you and your loved ones are well, but if you are struggling, I encourage you to reach out. Our pastors want to stay in communication with you. They want to pray with you, and they want to get you the help that you might need during this time apart. You can call our church office or visit saumc forward slash updates to request assistance. Thank you, St. Andrews, and peace be with you. And now I invite you to join me in a wonderful morning of worship to our living God through our Savior, Jesus Christ, and by the abiding of his Holy Spirit. Good morning, St. Andrews. <clears throat> it's great to see you all here this morning, that we are all united by one spirit and one heart in worship this morning. Before we get into the sermon, I ask that we just take a moment for prayer, and then we'll hop into the scripture. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, this ability to join together, even though we're physically apart, and unite with one another in heart and in mind to the task of worship. May this be a time where we focus on you, that we share praises to you, and that we are filled with your spirit. Lord, open our hearts and our minds this morning to the reading of the word and the preaching 
that is to follow. May it continue to guide us and fill us in all the things you wish us to do to have us grow closer to you and to one another. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture this morning that I'll be reading is from the Gospel of John, starting uh, Gospel of John in chapter 20, starting at verse 11. Mary stood outside of the tomb crying. As she cried, she bent down to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels dressed in white where the body of Jesus had been one at the head and one at the foot. The angels asked her, Woman, why are you crying? She replied, They have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they have put him. As, she, as soon as she said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was him. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said in Aramaic, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Don't hold on to me, for I haven't gone up to my father. Go to my brothers and my sisters and tell them that I am going to my father and your father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene left and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Then she told them what Jesus had said to her. It was still the first day of the week that evening while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Jesus came and stood among them, and he, and he said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. <clears throat> when the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Jesus appears to the disciples and to Thomas. Thomas, the one called Didymus, also the twin, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he replied, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in his wounds left by the nails, and put my hand in his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples again were in the house, and Thomas was with them this time. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. He said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand at, into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, My Lord, my God, Jesus replied, Do you believe me because you see me? Happy are those who don't see me yet believe. May the Lord add his richest blessing to the hearing and the preaching of his word this morning. Well, it was interesting as I drove to church this morning, and as I was driving, there was a, a thick cloud of fog that was over the road, and it was chilling to me to the point that it was as if the Holy Spirit was saying, remember this. And as I was thinking about it, it drew me back to the scripture about that first Easter Sunday, about how Mary made her way from the upper room through the streets and outside of the town to the tomb. And I can only imagine uh, that there may have been heavy mist or dew or fog as she made her way to the tomb. And if you look geographically on a globe, 
And you trace your finger all the way around from where Jerusalem, Jerusalem is, all the way around the world to where we are in the States, they share the same region as Delaware. So it's not completely out of the question to imagine that there may have been mist or heavy dew or fog that morning as Mary made her way to prepare Jesus' body. And as she made her way, she came upon the tomb with the rock rolled away. And that was the only context that Mary had for that situation. Her mind immediately from experiencing the worst possible thing to yet again still something worse. All of a sudden, she had, came, she had come to honor her Lord, her friend, her Savior, Jesus. And then she was denied so at an empty tomb. And she was completely distraught. I can only imagine the time from the crucifixion to that point that she wept and wept deeply. And thinking that she could weep no longer, she got herself together to go and prepare Jesus' body. And then, confronted at this sight, wept some more. I can only imagine the deep sadness and despair that Mary was on the edge of. And as she's weeping, as she's begging those angels who she could not wrap her head around as angels, asking where the body of Jesus was, she is met by Jesus himself before her, and she does not recognize him because the amount of grief and heartache that she was experiencing in that moment. And she pleads with the gardener, and knowing that she was in danger because of the Jewish authorities, at this point, the only thing that mattered was Jesus and honoring Jesus. Throwing that aside, she asked, wherever you've taken the body, please just let me know. I'll go get him myself. All of a sudden, it didn't matter about her life. It just mattered about Jesus. And in that moment, Jesus provided exactly what she needed. He called her by name, Mary. From that point on, it began something new in Mary's life. It provided that necessary closure that she had originally gone there for. Although she wasn't going to go there to prepare Jesus' body as a form of closure, but she experienced the resurrected Jesus. This new, unexpected way of Jesus coming into her life and meeting her there talk to what she was experiencing. Jesus knew exactly what to say to her in that moment. And as the scripture sort of implies that she hugged him and he said, don't, don't hold on to me. I have yet more things to do. I have yet to go to the Father. And I need you to tell my disciples, my brothers and my sisters. So go and tell them. Jesus provides exactly what Mary needs. He calls her by name. He saves her from that despair that she was so close to being consumed by. And I have an idea of where Mary is coming from. You see, I have experienced that deep personal loss in some way. And I feel that we all have in some sort of way. That there are times in our lives that we experience that and our body does its best to just go back into its usual routine. I understand what it's like to mentally and spiritually be far off, far distant from where I am and my body just robotically doing the things it needs to get things done. Coming from... Um, the point of when I moved in with my aunt and uncle for the first time, those first couple days were, were incredibly rough. At that time, it was beyond clear that my mother could no longer care for my siblings and me. And when I first, that first morning, 
my body got up, I went to the kitchen, and I tried to have breakfast. And it was just too much. You see, as that familiar routine of things and just trying to get things back to normal as we're trying to process what we've processed, sometimes those wave of emotions from that sort of that familiar routine and regularity may be the tipping point. And we may just break down at that point. And it wasn't until retrospect that I could really identify with Mary. Because at that point, um, I didn't know Jesus. It wasn't until years later in high school where I accepted Jesus into my heart did I begin to realize that Jesus met me in that moment to show me and give me precisely what I needed. That grief, that pain, the sadness, the anxiety that we all have or that we have yet to experience depending on where we are in our lives is a real and true thing. The power of the resurrection goes beyond what we think is humanly possible and does precisely what humans cannot do and provide for us the healing that only God can give. It is truly a miracle because we ourselves, in all of our prowess, cannot do it. And that sort of brings me to the other side of the story, the story with the disciples, the disciples and Thomas. And it's absolutely incredible, uh, the images that we have in scripture this morning. It brings chills to me even in this moment because we are experiencing what, uh, what the disciples are experiencing, being sealed off in our each individual upper rooms. And I don't wish to downplay the seriousness of our health and public scare and the, what the disciples were experiencing. But I can be confident and, and offer you assurance that they felt mortal fear for their lives and their loved ones. You see, in Jesus' time, where the disciples were at this point, when a revolutionary arises <clears throat> and is put down, their followers are also targets for the same end. So the disciples hid away in the upper room, only leaving that place for, necessi uh, for necessary things like food and water. They were there, and they knew the danger around them. And I hope you hear that this morning, that it's relatable to protect ourselves, to hide away, even though we are completely disconnected. And those feelings may fester, and we may look towards despair. But even in that time, Jesus appears among the disciples, you see, Thomas was out doing whatever he was needing to get done. Maybe it was his turn to go out and get supplies for the group. And while he was away, Jesus shows up. And he offers them, and he, and he shows the disciples gathered there, his body, his hands, and his side, and breathes upon them the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, communally, they are given exactly what they needed to turn from despair. That seed of hope that was planted long ago with the continual teachings of Jesus was being watered and nourished in that moment as Jesus provides for them the confirmation that what he came to do was not what they expected, but was something more. And so they were elated. They were ecstatic. They were seemingly losing their minds with joy. And so when Thomas returns and Jesus is not there and he receives the news, Thomas's reaction is not far-fetched for me because he wasn't there to experience it. And I feel like Thomas 
gets the short end of the, the stick of history and the fact that he's referred to doubt as doubting Thomas. And I don't think that's very fair for Thomas. You see, Thomas, in hearing the news, cannot just do a complete 180 and just be swept up in the fervor and the joy of his companions. Because he says to them very plainly that I experienced the same trauma you did. And I have this sea of emotions and feelings and, and, and sadness. And it's deep. I can't just simply betray those things just to fit in or experience whatever joy that you have. I need to see Jesus. I need to see the wounds. I need to see him as you have saw him. And I feel that's very important for us to hear. Because some of us may identify more with Thomas than, say, the other disciples, like Peter. See, Peter is all gung-ho, ready to jump in in any situation with both feet, and he's ready. Myself and others, we take, need to take a little bit more time and be discerning, to be honest with what's going on in our lives and not just go off the cuff all of the time. Sometimes we need to think things through. And I think that's what Thomas is saying here. You see, I think Thomas is saying something about Jesus. And he has this gift of discernment to say that, you know, these are the things that I'm experiencing. And if I, if I just turn away and, and accept whatever you're saying at face value, I'm going to betray that. And I know Jesus, and he knows my heart of hearts. And if I, anything that I know from Jesus, he would say, be true to your heart of hearts. See, Thomas expresses his needs spiritually and emotionally in that moment. And that could be a guide for all of us here and today, especially in this time of pandemic, in this time of social distancing. We need to be honest and express our needs spiritually and emotionally. So eight days later, Jesus returns, this time with Thomas there, and he shows him what he showed the disciples. He offers his hands and he shows the side. And again, Jesus says, Here's, here I am. And in that exact moment, Thomas is granted what he is needed, spiritually and emotionally, to begin that next phase, that next season of his life. And to continue to heal along the way. And Jesus says, you know, it may have taken you to see me physically, but there will be people that, and generations that will not see me like you have seen me. And they will, too, be blessed. You see, our needs are like the needs of the disciples. Even though we are in different centuries and we have different technologies and things are much better than what they were a couple thousand years ago, there's still sadness and suffering and anxiety. And some of us may be teetering near the edge of despair because we are separated from our loved ones and our church family in a physical sense. And I encourage you this morning to take the half a moment, take a breath. Don't get wrapped up in those um, feelings. And also don't get wrapped up into surface level happiness or, or uh, crafted joy. And take the time to express and share what you need spiritually and emotionally and in most cases physically. I encourage you to do that because as we band together like the disciples did, do we get to see that miracle of the resurrection. 
And with Jesus' commandments to the disciples beforehand, we see the fact that the work of the church back then and today and, the, and in the days and months to follow is important. That the work of the church is going on right now and will continue to go on. And I see this, in, this work at St. Andrew's in a very special way. That the fact that we have support ministries for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, who are struggling with sicknesses and illnesses, for um, those who are caretakers for others, they're meeting regularly. That our discipleship practices are not being swallowed up with the fear and the challenge of distance, but our leaders are taking the time to learn new technologies that they were not comfortable with before to provide Bible study and Sunday school opportunities so that we may continue to grow in a growing relationship with Jesus. That our children and our youth leaders are feeding our younger generations, providing them scripture stories and content across the web so that they may feel connected and so that they may continue to grow. And that our outreach programming, our Andy's Angels, our Meals on Wheels, and our other outreach groups are doing everything that they can to think differently so that they may provide for the needs of not only our church family, but for the surrounding community. And with this, I offer this prayer to you, that you continue to be inspired by the Holy Spirit, that you continue to follow after God's promptings that you go and you turn back to scripture to be uplifted and strengthened in this time but you also be patient with one another take the half breath or the full breath and the time to discern things and just come from a different angle if need be to lift one another up i know that the word crisis is used over and over and over again. But I encourage you not to be swept up in that fervor of the word. And practice what Thomas does. A little bit of discernment. And for those who can identify with Thomas the most, I encourage you to be uplifting and graceful as you discern. Because even though you may offer that wisdom, it may fall harshly on ears and deflate the passion around you. If this story has taught me anything about these groups of people, about Mary, the disciples, or Thomas, in this, in this small bit of scripture, is that it takes a village. That we all have different gifts, different needs, different requirements but we're all needed. We're all needed for the advancement of the kingdom. And so with that, we're going co to continue to serve one another and the community around us. See, the resurrection of Jesus tells us very important things. It shows us the intentional love that Jesus has for his disciples. It shows that Jesus is willing to provide exactly what his believers need. He provided exactly what Mary needed, the disciples needed, and Thomas needed. In very different ways. He too can overcome the boundaries of physical distance. We see that in the story, and I hope you feel Jesus' presence in your hearts and your minds this morning. That we are not completely alone in this. That the resurrection shows that Jesus is worthy to be praised because Jesus does something that is not humanly possible. That the teachings he has given throughout his entire life were true. And the meanings behind them may have been a little different or challenging, but they were nonetheless true. He is worthy 
of receiving our praise, our pain, and our suffering. He is worthy to rest our hope in. So again, I encourage you to rest your hope in Jesus. The fact that he appears to his disciples behind locked and sealed doors should be encouraging to you this morning. I pray that you continue to do the things that provide safety to your family, that you be wise in when you leave your homes, that you do so in a spirit of necessity and in kindness to one another, to our larger community. And I encourage you to turn back to scripture, to turn to one another, to lift one another up in prayer, to be Peter to some, to be Thomas to one another, to show the love and care of Jesus, the same as Jesus showed to us. Amen. And let us just take a quick moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. These stories of Jesus, these stories of Martha, these and the stories of Mary and the disciples and of Thomas. We ask that you continue to keep us safe in this time of social distancing, that we may go and continue to share your love in the best ways possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join us in the hymn. Now with hope in our hearts, let's come to God in prayer. Will you bow with me, please? Lord God, this day we have come to worship you here in a building, but also in our homes, wherever we are, Father. In these moments, we turn to you and give you words of praise and adoration. You have not only created all that is, but you have sustained it and you have redeemed it. And Father, thank you for that personal care you've given to each one of us. Hear the prayers, O oh God, that we bring to you from a variety of different places, but our hearts are together as we focus on you, O oh God, to give you praise and glory. Thank you again for your wondrous, wondrous love 
your mercy and your grace. And even as we come, Father, Jesus has told us we can come and come with our hands out asking for your involvement in life. And so we do, Father, first thanking you for that. Thank you for your constant care, your strength and courage, especially through these trying times. We ask that your presence be very real to those that are lonely in these times, for those folks who are hurting and need to know that you care about them and that we care about them. And so, Father, we come. We give you thanks for that. We thank you for good surgery that some of our folks have had and healing is coming for them. We thank you for your continuing care for our children. And we're hearing from, from folks, Father, that some of the children struggle with their learning, and we want you to help them with that, please. And, Father, all of us come and ask that there be an end to this virus. That, that you would come in a powerful way and remove this bug that seems to be enveloping the world and bringing death and destruction and, and despair, Father. But, Father, you've given us hope, a hope based in your Son, Jesus Christ, and, and that hope is real for us. And, and so, Father, it's with that hope and that love and that grace, all that we can muster, Father, we come and offer it to you and ask for your blessings upon it. And now, folks, would you share with me as we pray together our Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Your giving enables us to continue to do God's work in the midst of adversity. It enables us to bring hope to the weary, to the world, and to share God's love with people who so desperately need to know that they are not alone. There's a giving link at the top right-hand corner of your screen. If you so feel led, please give through that link at this time. And if you're more comfortable giving via a check, then we invite you to mail it to St. Andrew's United Methodist Church at the address before you. Thank you for being faithful and staying committed to being disciples of Jesus Christ our Lord. Help us on the chorus for this piece.
join me in a moment of prayer. Gracious God of light and hope, we bring our offering before you this morning, still riding the joy of our Easter celebration, your triumph over the grave. Scripture has reminded us that we have been given the pathway to a new birth, the promise of an imperishable heavenly inheritance, and the power of God's protection. Silent in the realization of these priceless gifts, we offer ourselves to make this good news known to those who have not yet heard or received that good news. With praise and thanksgiving, we dedicate these gifts in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. You know, it's interesting as we come to close our service, the spread of this thing we call Christianity. If you read anything about church history, you know that it wasn't the fact that, you know, the, the disciples experienced Jesus and then just went out to tell people. It was because of the resurrection and their true conviction in that experience, did they spread the word and hope and joy that Jesus has done something more than they could ever possibly imagine. So go with these words. 
May God go before you to lift you up and grant you clear minds to know his will, pure hearts to share his love, and eager hands to build his kingdom in all things and in all places. Know that Jesus is there to provide for you exactly what you need in all times and in all spaces. In Jesus' name, may you go in peace. Amen. Thank you.